Where is the one born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. God, creator and sustainer of the universe, in his mighty hands had a star to announce the coming of the Son of God to anybody but Gentile magi from the east. In this morning's passage, we discover God using the heavens as a sign of his great power as well as his promises. Promises fulfilled. We discover God himself, he is mighty. He makes promises to we who are weak, which we can, be, we can trust with our all that God is trustworthy. So if you found your place, Joshua 10, 1 through 15, let us pray for the Father's help as we study this morning. Heavenly Father, humbly we come, that might you speak truth and truth always, that in your word there is power, power that we come, we who are fools, and we find wisdom. For your word makes wise the simple. So Lord, humble us, that we may be made wise, that we behold Christ in your word, Behold the one who is exalted, the one who laid down his life for his friends, the one who rose in triumph, ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, he who is our one and our only mediator. O Lord, we ask, humbly and with thankful hearts, teach us and grant to us much needed mercies, which are rich and are free. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Over 500 years before Joshua camps at Gilgal this evening, down at Hebron, a ways south of Jerusalem, the patriarch Jacob's beloved wife Rachel gave birth to Joseph. The boy who sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, falsely imprisoned by Potiphar, having come second in command of all of Egypt below Pharaoh in order to not only save Egypt, the land around them, to save his family from famine. The people of Israel camping at Gilgal under Joshua's command were the wilderness generation, raised in wandering by parents who escaped Egypt by the mighty hand of God. We finally hear about this important city of Jerusalem. All this coming up to this climax, too, we finally hear for the first time the city of Jerusalem. What happened? What has happened to this city in Israel's absence from the promised land for so long? Now, if you know your Bibles, way back, there was a man named Melchizedek. He had come from this area. Yes, Genesis refers to him being the king of Salem, the king's valley. But Psalm 76 connects Salem to Jerusalem or Zion. The king of righteousness is the name Melchizedek. He was the priest king of the God Most High, and he had come to bless Abraham. Now, Jerusalem is ruled by Adonai Zedek. Notice at the end of his name, the same Zedek that Melchizedek has. His name means the Lord is righteous. But Jerusalem is now occupied by Jebusites. This king is no worshiper of Yahweh. There's no fear of God in his eyes. But we find that city-state king does fear, and he fears greatly, says the text. Now, geography will become important in the setting of Joshua's southern campaign of taking the promised land. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard of the treaty that Gibeon had made, um, which was the main power of the coalition of the four cities of the Gibeonites. Gibeon sat just six miles to the north of Jerusalem, noticing that any treaty would be a threat to their existence. And such a treaty that he signs with Joshua and the Israelites is threatening to Jerusalem. Now, of course, Adonai Zedek who heard the hot news that had been spreading throughout the entire land. Everywhere Joshua has gone, they had heard this before. Right? Joshua and Israel had taken Jericho. They've taken Ai. It is here that this Amorite king of Jerusalem is said to have feared greatly. The same wording the Gibeonite leaders had when hearing of Joshua and Israel defeating Jericho and Ai. If you remember, the Gibeonites feared greatly which has led them into trying to deceive Joshua and the leaders of Israel into this covenant. 
Now, what terror strikes at the heart of those opposing God's people? You, you notice this wherever they're going. There is terror in their hearts. These are not wimps. These are men at arms. These are men who, who lead whole armies into battle. They have seen battles. They have defenses. But they have heard what God has done. And it's, and it's not because the, the, the people of God are so terrified. And they might be fearful when they see them come, but it's only because of what is accompanying them. It is the Ark of the Covenant. Our God is with us. Uh, who, who, we who are meek, we who are gentle, we who are lowly, as our Savior has taught us to be, we turn the other cheek, we walk the extra mile, we're persecuted, insulted, not taking God's justice in our own hands while we're on the earth, but rather waiting patiently for the return of Christ with this promise. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. So our word of warning to the world is not simply, look at us, look, we're just to be gentle and meek and live kind of a peaceable life in your midst. Yes, we do, but we do so awaiting the promise. Christ is returning as judge. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we find, not only in this passage, but pretty much throughout our scripture, there are two fears. I think, I think we can reduce it down to just the two. There is the fear of the Amorites, right? The fear of Adonai Zedek. It's the great fear of the vengeance of God. And there is that fear of the Lord which begins that journey of wisdom. Right? Charles Bridges, in his commentary in Proverbs, calls the fear of the Lord an affectionate reverence. It's a warm fear, filling our hearts with love for a God who would dare to love us first. There are these two paths before everyone. And I notice that both of them have the title, fear. So you're going to walk somehow in fear. The great fear of refusing repentance, refusing the rightful worship of God, it's this, or there's this fear of the Lord that is walked by faith. A fear that dismisses all fears with the same promise that to Joshua. Coming from the very mouth of the Lord. Do not fear. It's this, it's this warm paradox, right? To the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom that hears these words. Do not be afraid. Now, back to the passage. Here comes the politics. Adonai Zedek knows his hand. Jerusalem feared Gibeon because it was bigger than Ai, says the text. And all its men were warriors. So it sounds like Gibeon is kind of like Sparta, right? They're just raising up boys for this one purpose, to be warriors. So Adonai Zedek pulls some strategy of his own with these politics. I have city-states willing to fight with me. So... What does Adonai Zedek do? He musters his allies, and he uses this message. So if you found your place here in Joshua 10, look down at verse 4. This is the message of Adonai Zedek to the four kings of his allegiance. Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon. And here's the reason. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. So there's the offense. The charge is not, not just anything. They have made a peace treaty with the enemies who have been given instruction by Yahweh to destroy us all. These Gibeonites are traitors. They made peace with our enemy Israel. Let's punish them for making peace with Joshua. Back in verse 2, Gibeon is described in four ways in the text. It's very poetic the way this is written his first state is a great city I meaning it's not just large but it's very important it has great influence in the region Gibeon is said to be like one of the royal cities so again its importance is so great it's like a capital of a royal district it is greater than Ai says the text meaning that we're we're talking about walls and defenses and every man is a warrior this is the four things that the text wants us to, us to know about what Gibeon is like and why Adonai Zedek feared greatly. The king of Jerusalem summons four allies, the same number, one for each trait of Gibeon to overrun them, right? You're going to wonder, well, what about the extra one, Adonai Zedek? He's going to match face-to-face -face with Joshua and the Israelites. 
All right, so you have this. We, have, we know the four greats of what the city is, cities of Gibeon are like. Let me call my four allies to match and overcome each of those. And so it seems like a political strategy for the ages. Perhaps the kings can best Gibeon for, them, for themselves before Joshua brings the ban, before Joshua and the Israelites do as God has commanded them to dis- devote everything to the destruction. Well, this newly formed coalition encamps together and then they end up provoking Gibeon to war. What's interesting is the men of Gibeon, these so-called feared warriors, right? They, every man a warrior, they themselves send word to Joshua. Not, not the king. The men of Gibeon send word to Joshua. Do not relax your hand from your servants. Joshua's treaty with Gibeon was one of word, right? Like, like we do contracts today, right? But it's just a word. Just like contracts are just a piece of paper. Will Joshua make good of what he has promised he will do? He didn't just promise it like we do nowadays with promissory notes and notaries. We're not just promising to some bank. We're not promising some sort of government official. Joshua made this promise in the name of Yahweh, the one true God. Will he be a promise-keeping man. Well, we find this in down in verse 7. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. Israel made a promise before God to be Gibeon's ally. So Joshua leads them into a war as a promise-keeper. And this, beloved, just as a side note, this is what godly leadership is. Right? I have made a promise before God in the name of God for the people, and I aim to keep that promise. God is a promise-keeping God, and godly leadership is displayed in being promise-keeping people. So we come to verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Here is the sealed promise of the Lord. First, he tells them, do not fear. He doesn't give them reasons all because they're not scary. War is scary. right? We think of it now, it's like, oh, just look at the world and just say, just downplay its seriousness, and that's not where the Bible goes. Do not fear them. Why? Because I'm mightier than them. right? The Lord is placing it on his own ability. My ability to defeat them and my ability to give you that victory, right? So it's it's both a mightiness and a compassion and, well, three ways. It's also his ability to say, look, I make a promise. I always keep it. So he he is giving that. Do not fear. Adonai Zedek feared greatly, if you remember. But there is no reason for you to fear Joshua because, yes, he has an army, but I am with you. And that is our promise, right? It's not, it's like, oh, because we're to just have a lot of self-confidence or be cocky or at least on the other end just say, oh, downplay the seriousness of of the opposition in front of us. No, the reality is like these things are too much for me, but I'm still not going to fear. Why? Because God is with me. He's promised to be with me. God will deliver them into your hands. No man will be left standing against you. The word hand connects this unfolding drama of this whole section. Gibeon asked Joshua for a hand against the five Amorite kings. Do not relax your hand, they said. Now the promise before the battle, God promises to hand them over to Israel. So you see this in verse 9. So Joshua came upon them suddenly having marched up all night from Gilgal. So Joshua takes the men of, at arms and the men of valor, and they get up from Gilgal, and without rest, they march all night and suddenly appear at the battlefield. It's like a movie, actually. Joshua shows up just at the nick of time. Joshua may have marched all night with his men, 
But the timing was God's sovereign providence. And we find out the confusion in the battlefield was God doing that. Right? Just at the sight of God's people, there's panic stricken. But there's, then we have a divine confusion. There's confusion at the ranks right when Joshua shows up at the right time. While Joshua and the men of Israel's rush stirs this panic confusion among the ranks of the Amorite coalition, this is a divine confusion, sending the enemies who feared greatly away from the battlefield that they were so sure, so confident, just moments before of winning. So the retreat is sounded, and the Amorites from the hill country run away uh, the way of uh, Beth Horon, as quickly as their legs would take him. Now, I want to tell you a bit of geography lesson here. That path is not an easy path. And we tend to think as Ohioans, it's like, oh, they just ran into a field, and it was pretty flat here. This is not flat. This is rocky. This is terrifying and hard terrain. The way of Beth Haran here is it's called the ascent for a reason. This path was an important trade route, through the hills and valleys, which is also another reason why Adonai Zedek found this to be threatening. This is threatening because it's closing off one of the main trade routes into Jerusalem. But running up from Gibeon up to Beth Haron would take you up from the valley to over 1,200 feet at, at Bet Ur Atavta, or to 2,000 feet at, at Bet Ur Alfalka. Of course, Ramah which eventually will be called uh, Nebi Samuel because that's where Samuel is said to have been buried. That's 3,000 feet. So you're going up 1,200, down to the valley. Up 2,000, down to the valley. Up 3,000, and that's the final descent where we were about to find out gone throwing hailstones at them finally. But this, that is a crazy retreat. Well, it is like, it's like the Appalachian Trail. For those of us who've been on it, fantastic. But I've only been on it as a leisurely hiker. I've never, I've never ran the Appalachian Trail being chased by people who want to kill me. So imagine they're running as fast as they can. They're running for their lives. And the retreating armies is said to have had run all the way to Azekah and Makeda. That's 25 miles of running up and down the hills toward the two cities being chased by an army which marched the entire night before. So there's a lot of exhaustion that's surrounding this passage. At least, you know, it's hidden in the background here. What does this retreating army discover as they're retreating? I'm trying to imagine it. They finally get down from Nebi Samuel, right? They're going down the descent finally. Having ran all this way, going 25 miles, and it's like there's this clearing. It's rocky. It's not, not a pleasant terrain, but it's, it's clear. Maybe they're running and they're making finally some distance away from the people of Israel. What do they discover? Are they getting away? And then they find out these enemies of God, they shouldn't just fear Israel. They should feel, fear the God of Israel, that Yahweh himself is a mighty warrior. Because God throws hailstones from heaven. And again, we find yet another Exodus connection. You're going to find this throughout the book of Joshua, this connection to him and Moses, the generation of the, of the children of the Exodus and their connection to the Exodus itself. But again, that is a pivoting connection. Let me, let me show you how it is in the Exodus. If you remember, hailstones fell from the sky on that seventh day of the ten plagues. Right? It, although it was a crazy hailstone because it caused fires everywhere, but it was judgment for refusing to let the people of God go into the wilderness to worship uh, Yahweh. And we find here in Joshua, again, hailstones thrown to deliver the people from Egypt. Now we find hailstones destroy an army so that people may be going into the promised land. So before, the Exodus generation has been delivered out of, and now we're going into Joshua where the people of God are being delivered into the promised land. There's the pivot. And what we see in the text, there were more who died of the hailstones then the sons of Israel killed the sword. That, that would have been news that would have spread very quickly. You know, you shouldn't be fearing Israel. There's something unique about them. 
that their victory is coming by divine providence. This is the Lord who fights the battles for his people. In all of chapter 10, Joshua and all Israel with him is mentioned seven times. So as you tell you, this might be really important to know, that there is a unity here. A unified people, 12 tribes, worshiping in unison of the one true God. Something of a break from the previous chapter when no one was inquiring of the Lord. They again call upon the name of the Lord in unison under a unified leadership, a godly leader who is praying again. It's not of the previous chapter just refusing to inquire of the Lord. Joshua's going back. Let us go to the wise king. And Joshua records what he and all Israel witnessed that day. Let's face it, this is the meat of the text, right? You think, oh, the, the unfolding drama of a battle seems fine enough. But then we come to verses 12 through 13. And at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord. Again, inquiring of the Lord, praying to the Lord. In the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel. So there is the worship gathering, right, the assembly. And this is Joshua speaking. Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. The sun, the moon, the lights of the sky from Genesis stood still until Israel killed every last man of that battle. And as it said, it has been all day. So you're thinking, well, I'm expecting sunset at least sometime and hours go by and the sun and the moon have not moved. Killer hailstones being dropped from the sky, that was miracle number one. But the ceasing of celestial bodies from moving across the earth's sky is a miracle of miracles. Now I know, in our postmodern age, there is this underlying pride of science that puts chains in, you know, puts their chins up in the air with this great confidence to say things like, this cannot happen. I, I, therefore, it did not happen, right? That's science. This cannot happen, therefore, it did not happen. Right? It, 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 what is, it's said with such great confidence, and that's, again, that's why it's called a miracle. It's, why it's rather fascinating. It's alarming to us who get used to the laws of nature as they go by, and when God intervenes in those things, it is kind of a big deal. But to say, like, oh, because I don't witness those things, therefore, it cannot happen. What is impossible with man must be impossible with God. As Christians, we confess the Bible to be trustworthy. But not because we just declare it. Not because we want our religious book to have some sort of emphases over the rest of the world around us. But because we recognize that God's speaking. All scripture, says Paul, is breathed out by God. This passage is told to us by God. Who is God? What is he capable of doing? Is God able to communicate to us effectively, precisely? Is he able to communicate to us truthfully, not just now, but always and forever with an unchanging character? Does he ever stumble over his words? Does God ever tell us a lie? Does God ever tell us a misinformation not knowing the future? The sun and the place it is as the precise heat and light is there because God spoke the sun to be there. The moon, the lesser light, he put it there exactly where it needs to be. God put all the entire universe and it's unknowingly to us, vast amount of stars and planets into their orbits exactly where they are to be. When I was a boy, and this is probably... But a lot of, uh, like, wow, he, Pastor Andy is weirder than I thought. It's, it's probably true. But when I was a boy, I remember I would just be wasting a summer's day putting mulch in front of this ant who just wants to get back to his colony, I'm sure. But I would put mulch in his path, and I would watch his little antenna, feel it, and then, 
oh, I'm going to go over here, and I put mulch over there, little pieces, and I'm sure my mom was thrilled that I'm taking mulch out of her garden to do this. But every time, he would feel it and then move the next journey. I'm sure, to his perspective, there's this giant out there is able to lift these massive trees and put them in my way. It's nothing for me. Nothing, you know. I, I finally you get bored and you're like, well, I wonder if I can make this cool path of mulch and then make at the end this massive tower of mulch to see if he'll feel it and see if he'll climb it because he can. Ants are amazing at this. And, and again, I spent a lot of time as a boy watching this unfold. Uh, to that ant, that one, the mulch thing, well, that's, that's a miracle, but massive hundred-story, you know, complex in front of me in matters of seconds is some sort of grand miraculous powers beyond my intellect. Oh, you think, you know, this poor ant looks at this massive giant of great power, and we think of the sun, right? It is some sort of extraordinary power to hang that into our sky. Right, to put it right there in the middle of our solar system and put these planets around it and spin them exactly where we are. I mean, you think about how, where the earth is precisely, but you think, wow, 93 million miles away. That's big. That's really big. And it's not to God. We I mean, think how far away these massive celestial things in our skies, and we have to get these very powerful telescopes out of our orbit to be able to cue in on these things, and those things are not actually all that far away compared to things that we cannot see. And yet God knows all of it. This is nothing to him. And we think, oh, what a great, extraordinary thing that he can make the celestial body stop. It is to us, from our perspective, because can you imagine trying to build a machine that could make the earth stop spinning or somehow make the sun and the moon appear stopping in our sky? We can't do it. We can't do it. But God can. This God who raised Jesus from the dead is a very powerful, dare I say, all-powerful God. How did the sun and the moon appear to not move across our sky all day until the last enemy dropped? The Bible doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us how. It's just the fact that he did. Now, verse 12 says Joshua spoke to the Lord. So by Joshua's initiative... He's talking to the Lord in front of the assembly during a corporate prayer time and telling the sun and the moon to stop. So what a change from last week's lesson where no one inquired of the Lord, right? What a great turnaround. Lesson learned. Joshua asked God in prayer to make the sun and the moon stop, and God answered. Now, I'll tell you, yeah, sure, this is a special circumstance. But I think there is a valuable lesson for us to be known here. And I ask you to just humbly examine yourself for a bit in this. Do you think this happened? Do you think that God is able to tell you something of our history that's just mind-blowing to us, and that's just because from our perspective that just seems wild, but to God it is nothing, right? I mean, he can do anything he wants, but do you think this happened? Even more important, do you believe God could do a thing like this? Is he able to in your belief. We hear our Savior say, if you have faith of the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Remember, this is what Jesus said. Nothing is impossible with God, and then he moves it like he had does through all the Gospels. Nothing is impossible for you. It's not that we go around moving mountains, right? That's not the lesson. It's that God could. We pray to God who could move mountains. He can make the mountain go right into the sea. He can make the sun stop. He can make the moon stop. And we pray with teeny, tiny mustard seed faith. So again, it's not our faith size. It's not our faith strength that accomplishes things. But who we have our faith in, who we are talking to in prayer he is able to do this. And Jesus is always interceding for us, and which is such a great comfort because we're not praying perfect prayers here. For you, Christian, he prays, he intercedes. And his prayers are always successful. 
And for you allow me, as a theologian, we use the word efficacious. It's always effectual. When Jesus asks the Father, the Father always responds. So you think this is something that Joshua can ask God to make the sun and the moon stop. Jesus is interceding for you and what he prays for you before the Father, Father does. He prophesied Peter's three-time denial the night of Christ's trial. Satan asks for you, Peter. He wants to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. The only reason Peter's faith did not fail is because Jesus interceded for him. How do we persevere in the faith? It's because I've mounted up all this intellect? No. No. Even in the face of sin, even in the face of the devil's afflictions, how am I to persevere? Jesus prays for his people. The power that made the heavens stood still, the power that can move mountains, is the power that is holding you up and holding to you, you together, you who have faith in Christ. The scene of Jesus in front of Lazarus' tomb fits well here. Roll away the stone, Jesus said. Martha spoke up. He's been dead four days now, the, the, the whiff, the smell would be tremendous. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? The glory of God we sinners once hid from, like Adam, our ancestor, is now walking in the cool of the day, we freely come beholding his glory, that he is for us, as we discover once again in this text, verse 14. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. You can almost hear it in the background of that text. Not for you, but for my name's sake alone have I acted. The Lord fought for Israel. The Lord is for us. God uses his matchless power to fight his people's enemies with a great terror that's written in the sky. It is a wonder that the amazing grace of our God is slow to anger with us. That with great love, compassion, even forgiveness toward us. His grace for his people means he fights for his people and not against his people. And not because of us, but because of his own holy character. Oh, how did we get, go from being sinful enemies of God to being in his grace that he is not against us, but for us. You're seeing the wrath of God who hates sin is poured out upon Christ, right? Upon his cross rather than me. I am ashamed of my sin, yet with great joy I thank my God, right? I was condemned to die. A sinner like me is given that promise. Everyone who lives and believes in Jesus shall never die. Look upon the dead men scattered along this hillside of Beth Haron, crushed by hailstones, slaughtered by swords as the sun stood still, giving them light all day long. We have offended God with our sin. And we look to the skies. Christ, the crucified and resurrected and ascended Savior, is coming back. And he's coming back with a fury far greater than Joshua. It is a dreadful thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of Christ. Don't you see that your sin is no small matter in heaven? That you deserve far worse eternal suffering than more, more horrible than hailstones and swords. When we think of our sins are not that big of a deal, that everybody else is sinning, we think of God himself as no big deal. That his holy character is no big deal in my eyes, so therefore, he shouldn't consider my sin such a big deal. I think that is why so many people find God's justice as offensive. Who is God to throw hailstones? Who is God to cast sinners into hell? People are offended by the gospel, this need for a savior, a, a savior who was tortured and mocked and murdered because his people don't think God's holiness is as serious, nor is sin to be taken serious. May great fear drive you toward our gracious God. Sinner, take comfort only in this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Joshua returned to camp at Gilgal, which sets up the next part 
of the chapter of the finding the five kings hiding in the cave. Uh, and that, that, will, that will set us up for two weeks, you know, the week after Easter. But I want to at least go through this very quick list. What's the big takeaways for a Christian from this text? First, I, I think it goes without saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. Right? Not, not only in this miracle, and we think, oh, the, man, that is something, but in the daily spinning and orbit of our own earth. Like to have a sun for light and heat to make life possible, creation, life, these are the works of our mighty God that are praiseworthy. The fact that I woke up this morning, that each breath of my lungs and each beating of my heart, these are God's work declaring God's glory. Second, that God is mighty. And we can usually just skip on, oh yeah, I know he's strong. Israel camped at Gilgal that night, and I'm sure there is deep reflection of everything they had witnessed the previous 24 hours, the march all night, the battle, the hailstones. They have seen the miracle of the heavens stopped. They witnessed God's hailstones defeating his enemies. An all-night march led to an all-day battle. Then the march back to Gilgal, which led Israel back up and down the hills that they had been running So it is at the end of our days, each and every day, no matter how exhausted you are, to lay our heads peacefully down onto our pillows and reflect on the day that has just passed behind us. God is mighty. God has used his power for my good. The small, even routine things of our daily lives, he has done great things, and I trust in him. Our faith is not in our own faith. But it is in our God of matchless power. He never loses one from the grip of his mighty right hand so we can trust our salvation in his promises and his power to save. Now lastly, Christ will remove all sin from the earth. He's coming back. Just as the enemies of God have been driven out of God's promised land, we the meek will inherit this New promised land, the whole earth, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. It was good for God to drive the wicked men from the promised land so that God may dwell with his people secure. Far better is the delight of Christ driving the wicked from this earth that we may live with him and enjoy him forever. No sin, no more violence, no more war, No more disease, no more famine, no more tears. So is the affection of Christ for his people and for his world. His redemption cleanses us to live with him forever, and he cleanses the earth to enjoy life with him in his kingdom for all eternity. Glory to our God who will do this. Amen. Let us pray as we...